Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and in preparation for an upcoming series on anemia, today I'm talking about the normal physiology of the red blood cell. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the structure and function of an RBC, to describe the steps in its maturation, and we'll be able to list the factors which regulate the production and ultimate removal of RBCs from the circulation. Starting with their structure, they are shaped as biconcave discs with a center less than half the maximum width of its edge. This gives the red blood cell a very large surface area to volume ratio, which aids in rapid gas exchange across the cell membrane. Mature red blood cells lack organelles, so no nucleus, meaning it contains no DNA. It has no ribosomes, so there's no new protein synthesis. The proteins an RBC has at the time it fully matures is all it will get over its remaining lifespan. And there are no mitochondria, meaning no electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. So where does this energy come from? About 90% comes from glycolysis, and about 10% comes from the hexose monophosphate shunt. RBCs have a remarkable ability to deform in order to accommodate small capillaries. This deformability is a consequence of the high surface area to volume ratio, meaning there is plenty of redundant cell membrane. The viscosity of the cytoplasm, which itself is predominantly determined by the intracellular concentration of hemoglobin, and the mechanical properties of the membrane, which are determined by integral membrane and submembrane cytoskeletal proteins that have great names such as anchorin, spectrin, band 3, and band 4.1. As you likely already know, the major function of the red blood cell is the transport of oxygen to the cells in the rest of the body, which it does with the help of the protein hemoglobin, by far the most abundant protein within red blood cells. A discussion of the incredible biochemistry of the hemoglobin molecule itself is outside the scope of this particular video, but it is covered in my video on dyshemoglobinemia from about the 7 minute mark. A link to that will be in this video's description. Significant minor functions of red blood cells include the fact that hemoglobin itself is an excellent acid-base buffer, and RBCs also contain a large amount of carbonic anhydrase, which catalyzes the reversible conversion of carbon dioxide and water to hydrogen and bicarbonate ions, thus significantly contributing to acid-base homeostasis. When the body produces new red blood cells, the cells must undergo a series of steps before they are released into the circulation and go on to evolve into mature erythrocytes. This overall process is called erythropoiesis. It starts in the bone marrow with the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Some of these cells will differentiate into the erythroid lineage, which after a few steps, results in a large blue cell with a high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio called a pro-erythroblast. Unfortunately, as with many things in medicine, there is not uniform terminology here. So sometimes these cells are referred to as pro-normoblasts. And some dogmatic hematopathologists might say that they aren't exactly synonyms, but they're close enough for everyone else. As the maturation process continues, the proerythroblast predictably becomes an erythroblast, also known as a normoblast, which is a smaller cell, has a grayer cytoplasm, and a relatively smaller nucleus. The erythroblast stage is subdivided into basophilic, polychromatophilic, and orthochromatic stages. Most notably, the general erythroblast stage is when hemoglobin synthesis starts, which is partially responsible for the shift in the color of the cytoplasm. Eventually, the erythroblast will lose its nucleus and some organelles, forming a reticulocyte, which looks kind of like a mature red cell, but are slightly larger and slightly bluer. Reticulocytes initially retain ribosomes, meaning that they are still capable of limited protein synthesis, such as synthesizing some more of the cell's hemoglobin. In normal circumstances, a reticulocyte, more commonly known as a retic, spends about three days in the marrow before entering the systemic circulation, where they will take about one more day to fully mature, losing their remaining organelles and becoming an erythrocyte. The normal lifespan of an erythrocyte is about 120 days. Therefore, in healthy adults, about 1% of circulating RBCs are retics. How does the body regulate that production of red blood cells? 
While it may seem obvious for there to be a downside to having too few red cells, like decreased oxygen-carrying capacity of blood, there's also a downside to having too many red cells. For one, the body will be wasting energy and other resources to produce them. But more importantly, red blood cells are a major contributor to the viscosity of blood. When there are too many, the blood gets kind of sticky, it becomes more difficult to pump, and more likely to experience pathologic thrombosis, and in general leads to a higher risk of a wide variety of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. So, it's important for the body to maintain the amount of red blood cells within an optimal range. The most significant regulator is a hormone called erythropoietin, which acts by increasing the rate of RBC maturation and which is released in response to tissue hypoxia, meaning tissues are not getting an adequate delivery of oxygen. This can be due to anemia, in which case the release of erythropoietin is adaptive and helpful, but it can also be due to chronic hypoxemia, for example in chronic lung disease, in which case occasionally it can be maladaptive if the downside from too many red cells leading to excessive viscosity begins to outweigh the benefit from the improved oxygen delivery. Most erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys, while a small amount is produced by the liver. The consequence of the site of production is that patients with chronic kidney disease have low erythropoietin levels and thus develop a condition predictably called anemia of chronic kidney disease. Other hormones which play a much smaller role in RBC production include thyroid hormone and testosterone, both of which stimulate RBC production, and a deficiency of which can lead to anemia. In addition to the hormones necessary for RBC production, there are also necessary nutrients. A complete list of nutrients is long, but there are three ones of primary clinical relevance. First is iron, which is an essential component of hemoglobin, and the other two are vitamin B12 and folate, which are both necessary for DNA synthesis. A lack of any of these three will necessarily lead to decreased RBC production and anemia. Red blood cells don't last forever. I mentioned a minute ago that their average lifespan in a healthy adult is about 120 days. When aged RBCs are removed from the circulation, it predominantly occurs within the spleen. But why don't they last forever? Why do they need to be removed at all? Well, over time, their proteins accumulate oxidative damage. Cycles of osmotic swelling and shrinkage result in cytoskeletal damage, which the red cells have a very limited capacity to repair since they no longer have organelles, like ribosomes. They gradually lose surface area over time, leading to decreased deformability. Repetitive deformations from squeezing through capillaries also damage the cytoskeleton. And the shearing forces on the cells from passing through heart valves also contribute to cumulative damage. That's it for this video on normal RBC physiology. If you found it helpful, be sure to look out for upcoming videos on more hematology topics like anemia and the interpretation of the CBC.